G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So I just wanted to say a quick thank you to everyone who shared their stories in the comments section of last week's video, and also thank you to everyone who voted by liking the stories to provide a favourite. And this week's winner was Nikki, so be on the lookout for their story. I'll be taking another story from you guys this week too, so if you have a story that you'd like to share, then drop it in a comment below to be voted on by you nutters through likes. Also, if you commented a story last week, you can just copy and paste it in this week's story too, and see how it goes again. It would be awesome if you could like the video and hit the notification bell as well guys so that you don't miss any uploads, and I hope you guys enjoy the video, so without further ado, let's bust a nut. This was an experience that I had alongside my best friend in high school. This was about 2006, maybe 2007, in a, a rural upstate New York place. We met in the third grade and are still friends to this day, and we're both 27 now. I know it can be tedious, but let me give you some quick background information before I begin. So my friend B and I became instant friends when we met in third grade, and we're inseparable. We frequented each other's home so much, so her mum set up a guest room that was practically my room. I had toys, clothes, pictures, I mean, everything that I needed was there pretty much. I was family. The pictures of B and I hung on the walls of the home owned by her very proud mother too, Shelley. Shelley always wanted two daughters and loved me so much that she considered me her second daughter. So her mother was divorced and she actually dated a few different men, meeting some off of sites like eHarmony. She had been speaking to a man for a few weeks, gushing about how manly and charming he was. She was really excited and always showed us their profiles before she decided to go on an actual date with one of these men. She always would say, I need my daughter's stamps of approval. One night, she called us into her room and showed us this man that she'd been talking about. His profile was simple, as one would imagine for a middle-aged man in 2007 on eHarmony. But the headline read, looking for a strong mother, and I made a joke about how his odd placement for caps and just how strange a way to start out that was, but we moved forward. It told of his metalwork background, his love of cold steel, and his work in a foundry that kept his icy heart just warm enough. I was honest and told her that it sounded off, but he was handsome. He was sporting black, well-groomed hair, a beard, strong jaw, ice blue eyes, and relatively fit body for a 40-something-year-old male. I did stress on the weird vibe, though, and then B joked how Shelley always picked out the antisocial ones, and we laughed knowing that this actually wasn't wrong. Shelley's brought some weird stories home, but I mean, what do you expect meeting people online, right? We told her to go for it, so they planned a dinner. It was a pretty big haul for him, about a two-hour drive, I think, and he was driving to our location where they would then take one car into town. B and I helped Shelley pick out her outfits, helped her with her hair and makeup, and then went back upstairs so that she could have some time to herself before the long night. We headed up the stairs where B and I were painting a wall in her room, just listening to music and cutting up and just doing all that sort of stuff. But when he got there, he just let himself into the house like no big deal and just came on up the stairs without saying a word. There was no knocking, no doorbell. I mean, the dogs didn't even bark. Nothing. So we get spooked, jump and scream, and we crap our pants a little, and then we hear a man start talking behind us. We don't know how long he'd been in the house, and we don't know how long he'd stood behind us without speaking, but when he did speak... We were shaking. Well, well, well. I didn't know I was getting a two-for-one deal. He said, quietly in a, a gravelly low voice. He chuckled as we stood there in shock of the stranger in her room. He sauntered over to us like a, a man on a Sunday walk. The smell of cigarettes filled the room as if Rod Serling himself was standing in the corner explaining our situation to the audience for our own personal episode of The Twilight Zone. Right then, I noticed how much this guy looked like the guy in the picture Shelley showed us. Except, he had salt and pepper and not jet black hair, and 
His eyes were not ice blue, but black. Not brown, but pretty much completely black. And it looked like this guy was 100% pupil. Are you? I was interrupted by Shelley shouting, who got hurt. She must have thought that we were horsing around and one of us got hurt, and this was normal for us because we goofed around a lot. She was jolted at the sight of this man blocking her from us, and he turned around just as soon as she reached the top of the stairs and held his arms out and said, in a way less low tone than he used earlier, Shelley, you look beautiful. I knocked and no one answered. I hope it's okay I let myself in. These are your gifts. And then he said, they're beautiful, like they're mummy. I'll never forget how he said mummy, because it felt uh, kind of dirty. B and I both side-eyed each other and stepped down off of our stepladders, and we were both very in tune with each other, and if I felt weird, she knew it. But we both felt the old air in the room, and Shelley glanced away from him and at us who were behind him, looking at her with wide eyes, both kind of shaking our heads side to side in disbelief. Shelley looked back to him. This exchange only took a few seconds, but seemed like an eternity, and she forced a smile at him and said, Oh, I'm sorry. Next time, just ring the bell. I'll come open the door. He nodded and walked towards her with open arms and hugged her like they'd been the oldest friends. She looked at us as they hugged and just kind of rolled her eyes to show us what she thought of his excuse. She proceeded to tell him that it was not appropriate as she led him down the stairs and we heard him apologize over and over again. B and I instantly ran to our phones and we agreed to text her mum what he had just said to us so that we could tell her without him knowing. We hit send and about 10 minutes later we hear footsteps up the stairs and it was Shelley and she shut the door behind her and asked us if we were okay and she hugged us and told us that she was sorry he made us feel so uncomfortable. She explained to us that he said that we reminded us of his girls and didn't mean to scare us. We nodded and then she said that they were leaving out for the date and we hugged her, said be safe and we would see her soon. As she headed down the stairs, B and I looked at each other. We both knew that something just was not right about this man but we were both speechless from the good scare that we received from this dark man just about 15 minutes prior. We heard them walking and talking, heading towards the front door a few minutes later. Shelley shouted up the stairs that she loved us, and we yelled back that we loved her, and then the door shut. We instantly started talking to each other, saying the same things, and B spoke over me. Yeah, he laid that charm on so thick as soon as he saw Mum. B exclaimed further. And did you see his eyes? What the hell was with that? He looks so much like the guy from the pictures, but... Not exactly, right? We both concurred on our feelings about the stranger, his scent, his demeanor, his voice. He was like something out of a, a classic Stranger Danger advert or something. Again, we agreed to text Shelley how we felt and she thanked us and told us that it seemed to be going well and she would let us know that she was safe every hour. B and I just were freaked out and even more so that Shelley was not. It was like a weird spell that he'd cast on her, and it was odd, but we wanted to think the best for Shelley, as she was excited about this guy, so we just kind of let it go. She texted us every hour until she got home, and her last text said, I'm okay, but officially freaked out, and coming home now, be home soon. Well, at that, we got freaked out and paced around until we saw headlights pull into the driveway. It had been about five hours since they left, and about an hour since that last text, too. We were inside with the lights off, watching through the side window, trying not to be seen, when the motion sensor light flooded the yard and light fell into the driveway. And a truck flew into the driveway. But the passenger side door flung open before the truck was at full stop, and Shelley's feet were on the pavement just as fast. She waved at the driver and kind of jogged to the door wide-eyed. She reached the front door, turned and waved the truck off. She had her house key ready in the hand that she wasn't waving with and she unlocked the door and slid inside the safety of the house. Girls, keep the lights off and let's go upstairs, okay? Shelley said as she locked the two deadbolts and the chain too. She didn't look at us either and we headed upstairs behind her and we walked into B's room and looked out the window down to the truck, still in park out the front with the lights on and the engine running. 
as we all stared at the truck, Shelley told us of the ordeal that she went through. But long story short, he had made a reservation at the wrong restaurant. So he suggested that they go buy some food and have a picnic style dinner at the local park. Shelley didn't do well outdoors. She was an office woman, so she declined. However, he had just drove so long to get there and then hit her with, you kind of owe me, and Shelley said that that made her feel bad, knowing that he drove two hours, so when he mentioned that he had a vacation home that he could cook for her at close by, she agreed. She said that they got to the house and it was nice enough, at Log Cabin near Bethel, New York, only about 35 minutes from our town. Shelley said that he kept talking about how easy it was to get her alone and he also kept saying that he liked strong mummies because they have such fight. But she caved, apparently. And this definitely made her skin crawl. This wasn't the man that she thought it was, and this also wasn't the man in the picture. And Shelley started to slowly realize this too. Shelley then said that she asked for a ride home due to her feeling ill, and he wasn't the happiest, but he complied and stopped cooking and started looking for the keys that she knew that he had in his pocket. He then started asking her about our girls, referring to myself and B. This freaked Shelley out so bad that she said that she was going to get someone to get her and that he didn't like this and found his keys instantly. Once they were out of the house and in the truck, the truck wouldn't start either, so they had to move to his work truck. Shelley was visibly shaken and wouldn't take her eyes off the truck in the driveway as she spilled the story out post haste. She said that there was a garage that he said that they could walk around to the house to hop in the work truck. She said that she felt she had no choice but to play it cool and just agree to go. She hopped out and walked around the house and there indeed was another garage with a truck in it. It was the same truck that we were all currently staring at just sitting in the driveway. And Shelley whispered to us that apparently it smelt like bleach and iron or metal or something. She told us on the way home that he just kept talking about us. What did we do that she didn't like? What got us spankings? What were the naughty things that we got in trouble for? What would she do without us? And the one question to scare you out of your pants as a parent, would you sacrifice yourself for our girls? Shelley said that she stared at him in awe and kind of disbelief and then he just laughed. She got more and more concerned as she noticed her surroundings in the back of the truck that she was riding home in too. There were what she thought were chains in a bucket sitting on a desk that was drilled into the floor, a duffel bag and very large metal objects that she wasn't too sure of. And this is when he started to pull out pictures on his little flip phone that he had of us. He must have found Shelley's Facebook and he took pictures of our pictures and had them on his phone. But waving it around telling Shelley what a, a good strong mummy she had been to us. And she should be proud of what she had accomplished. By this time, they were pulling into the driveway and Shelley was done with this crap. She was just about finished when she saw the truck lights turn off though. Shelley immediately picked up the phone and dialed the sheriff and told him quickly that there was an unwelcome person outside of our home. Being in such a small town, the sheriff not only went to school and graduated with Shelley, but only lived three doors down too. And just as we see this guy getting out of his truck with a duffel bag no less, we saw the sheriff whip up behind him. The man panicked and literally threw his duffel into his truck and tried to back into the sheriff to get out. When he realized that he was blocked from the rear, he went through the yard and we could not believe our eyes. The truck peeled out, taking some of the lawn with it. The sheriff came to the door to check on us and told us that he had units down the road waiting for him. We all shared a good collective cry and rejoiced in our safety after that. It did, however, create some paranoia issues in the next couple of weeks due to the fact that we didn't know how long he was in the house when he just let himself in for. I mean, we were asking questions like, did he put cameras anywhere? Did he mess with the food in the house to hurt someone? I mean, it was bad, but we eventually worked through it. We never did hear anything about him getting caught, and 
We did occasionally receive eerie messages on Facebook, two of which we knew were him, but we put that out of our minds. And we haven't heard anything from or about him since about three months after the incident when the last message was received. It's been about 11 years since the incident, but we still talk about it, when we can that is. I go to school in a big city that is one of the least safe cities in all of the US. I chose this school for nursing and definitely not for the location. I live in a row house, I think that's what they call it anyway, off campus with four other girls. But cheaper and nicer than dorms, or so we thought, but uh, I guess you get what you pay for, right? So we're all girls and sophomores in college. As you would guess, we go out and drink and come back and do things that we don't remember. We had just started our rent in August, three floors plus a basement which was padlocked by the owners. It was understandable, I mean, we would definitely have parties down there to avoid immediate cleanup and whatnot. But the house was great too, amazing location to the school and work, and I'm a CNA who works odd hours, which is important for later. It wasn't too expensive, and it was in good condition, and I'd never lived with that many people before. Just one roommate, so before we definitely knew if one of us had misplaced or changed something, we would always ask each other. But I started to notice that my snacks were either half gone or completely gone. I was getting annoyed, but a house of many people is just too much work to figure out who ate what, so I just kind of ignored it. Slowly, as girls do... We started making comments about someone eating our food, but kind of passively aggressively. You know, college girl stuff. We all just let it go because who wants a whole house fight, right? Now, I work until about 11 in the NICU, get home at about 11.30, mostly on weeknights. And I started to notice pans left out or snack wrappers around and whatnot. I thought it was odd because none of my roommates had done that before, but... I just thought, well, they probably drank a bottle of wine and then went to bed and just forgot about all this. Again, my roommate started making comments. This time, we started to ask because it was getting annoying. All of our food being gone and things being left everywhere was just getting a bit much. I knew at the time that it was definitely one of them, but, I mean, who wants to admit that they ate someone else's snack in college? Snacks are a high commodity, right? We chalked it up to the girl who always smokes and eats her weight in food, and she swore that it wasn't her though. This went on for about two months, and it got more obvious someone was clearly taking everyone's food. At the time, we definitely thought it was the girl that always smokes. I mean, I see her eat her whole snack pantry in a night pretty much. Now, one night at work, I was about to get off, but uh, a situation happened, and I didn't end up leaving until about 12.30. I took the bus home. I carry pepper spray, a taser, and a pocket knife, so I had nothing to worry about there, and I got home and was about to collapse. I wanted to go to bed ASAP because I was exhausted. I walked in the front door, and the stairs are directly in front of you, and you can also see down the side into the kitchen. So I walked in and saw someone in the kitchen, but was way too tired to say hi, thinking it could end in like a 30-minute conversation about nothing, so... I just went straight upstairs. When I go to the second floor, I noticed all of my roommates' doors were closed, which always means that they are all either in their room for the night or asleep. And upon seeing that, I, I got a weird feeling. Just something that made it click. They were all asleep, right? I texted our house group chat asking if anyone was in the kitchen, and I felt stupid for even asking. Two responded no, and they said the other two had been asleep for a long time. It was at that point that I knew that it wasn't any of my roommates down there at that moment. So I dialed 911, but didn't press call, and I crept into my roommate's room across the hall. Thankfully, or maybe not thankfully, she didn't have her door locked. I whispered telling her that I think someone is in the house, and... She gave me the widest eyes ever and almost looked like she was going to cry. She didn't suspect anything like I had, but for reference, a, 
a very bad area, as in there was a shooting in the house two doors down only weeks earlier by an intruder, was where we lived, so it was definitely not out of the question. She mouthed to make the call, and the whole time we were pretty much dead silent. We didn't hear really anything at all. I was starting to think that uh, maybe I was just seeing things after such a long day at work, and was regretting that I dialed, thinking that I'm going to look like an idiot when they show up, and I was just overtired and dreamy. We explained what was going on, and they said that they'll send someone ASAP. And that actually does mean right away here, since it's a pretty big and dangerous city. The police showed up, and I didn't even want to go downstairs, but the operator confirmed that it was them, so I did. But the whole time, I, I could have sworn the operator could hear my heart beating. It was that loud. So, the police come in and look around, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I, I look so stupid. They ask if there are any other floors and we tell them technically the basement, but it's padlocked, so really no. They check the basement just in case and, well yeah, they were right. Apparently, a man had been living in the padlocked basement this whole time. The lock was pulled off the hinges and it just kind of propped up against the wall. We never looked at that though and we rarely went out back. But apparently... The guy had taken a comforter of one of my roommates out of the hall closet, had a mattress from God knows where, and his clothes, and, well, he was the one moving and eating all of our stuff. He would just come out in the middle of the night and do it, and he started getting more comfortable. I don't know if he was drugged out and forgot to clean his tracks, or he just didn't really care. But me and my roommates have pretty consistent schedules during the week, probably letting him think that any time after about 12 was good to come out. We never slept with our individual doors locked, and that's kind of what freaks me out the most. He had access to any one of us at any moment, and we had no idea that he was there the whole time. When he was getting arrested, I was the only one to go down and look, and I don't know why I did, and to be honest, I, I wish I didn't. But... I took a picture in the process of him being arrested to show my roommates who were too afraid to go down. And this is him. This took place two summers ago in the hometown of the Cowboys. Now, I'm aware of human trafficking in this city, and I had a co-worker pulled out of work and put in a safe house by the FBI because she finally decided to rat on her family. However, I never thought that they just randomly snatched people. In all the stories that I heard, they used drugs or coercion. So two summers ago, I'm cycling to a smoke shop. It's kind of out of my way and not a great neighborhood, but I'm fairly confident and it's daylight and I ride all over the city and I know the store. I was 24, short, and had short pink hair, but I always considered myself too intimidating to kidnap. I forget that even if I am a veteran, I'm also a short white girl. I pull up to a crosswalk and I'm waiting for a light when two Hispanic guys just start catcalling me from the windowless white van. There's no identification, no stickers, even the way they yelled at me was a, a little bit weird. It wasn't the typical nice body, ha ha ha, let me have you, locker room kind of stuff. They would talk to each other and then yell through a cracked window about how we're going to get you, you're next. It felt off, like they were excited, but I just flipped them off and rode away. End of story, right? Over a mile later, I'm right around the block from my destination. To set it up, there was a massive empty lot, really more like two lots on my right. That was the side that I was riding down. To my left, there was a back fence of a very, very old and probably abandoned house. It was like that all around, mostly drifters or old people in poverty. A few trap houses if you catch my drift. The point is, is that there was no one else visible, and even if they had seen this, they probably wouldn't have said anything for their own safety. I'm pedaling along when the album ends, and I think... I'm almost there and I'm not going to stop and fumble with my phone. And I think this saved my life that day. As I'm thinking this, a white van pulls up on my left and stays right inside my peripheral. 
but they revved the engine a few times and tried to spook me, but something told me not to move. But don't let them know that you know kind of thing. So I acted like my music was playing and pedaled a little faster. Up ahead of me was a brick wall to my left and a tall tree over it, before a quick alley entrance. And suddenly, they punch the gas and pull up in front of me, stopping next to the brick wall. But they were trying to corner or funnel me, putting me into a position where I had to ride between their door and the wall. And this all happened in a, a span of maybe seven seconds. It was quick, though. Surprisingly, I, I didn't feel panic, though. I didn't actively register any fear or sweat or anything. It was like someone much calmer just took over my body and was like, nope. I remember instantly crossing the street without even thinking about the movements or why, and as I paddled up the other side, I realized that this was the van from before, and now it has a window repair magnet on the side. It's too small to look good and has absolutely no contact info whatsoever. Just a, a generic name. I kept rubbernecking and see that there was no one in the front, but there was movement behind the seats. The guys were in the back by the door, and... They had planned to literally drag me off my bike, off the street, and do God knows what to me. Once I passed, they scrambled into the front seat and pulled out so hard that they burnt rubber. I got to the store safe, but I, I still hate myself for not taking the plate number. Not that it would have done any good. They probably switched them out anyway later. But I knew that I had almost been kidnapped and killed, or worse. But it wasn't until I told the story to someone from Mexico that I found out that these were probably traffickers. They said it sounded sadly familiar and apparently happens all the time. I have no family and my roommates are just roommates. I would have been gone for three to seven days before anyone even decided something was wrong. And even then they would have just known that I left on my bike and vanished. I would have been across the border or dead before anyone even knew that I was gone. So I would say that I was pretty lucky that day. For context, I've lived in the middle of the forest in southern BC Canada for my whole life and only recently have I noticed some strange things occurring. I'm wondering if it's due to all the forest fires that we've had in the last few years and Lots of wildlife have been forced to move from their homes and whatnot. This has caused a lot of wildlife to disrupt the usual flow of things as they try to find food and new places to live. Though, this is uh, only one explanation I've come up with so far. So, closer to the end of the year, my German Shepherd Kita has been barking a lot around the house. More and more often, too. Usually, I chalk it up to her being bored, but I can tell by the different bark she makes if something is actually there. Also, it's not uncommon for her to just kind of dash off into the brush after some unknown animal. It's usually a deer though, with her little mutt sidekick, Jazzy. They can be gone for hours at a time too. Anyway, I wake up one October night to hear the strangest sound coming from outside my window. I live on the second floor of my house with the deck right below me and the sound was so close that at first I was scared something was in my room. As I got out of my bed, I realized that... Whatever it was had to be directly below me outside. It had to have been right up against our house too, which it was pretty ballsy for any wild animal, considering the smell of our dogs and us humans should be everywhere. It sounded sort of like a howl maybe. Though, I don't think it was a howl because both my dogs have never made or are able to make that. But trust me, I know it. It was really low too and almost sounded sad. But... A bit like a rumbling growl too, as if whatever it was was lazily but persistently just breathing out the sound. No way was this my dog, and it sounded unlike any coyote or wolf that I've ever heard. But because I've lived out here so long and often enjoy camping in the woods, I've heard countless wolves and coyote sounds. In fact, I've gotten pretty good at differentiating between them. Also, it's extremely unlikely that it was a neighbor's dog. I mean, no neighbor's dog dares come near our house because our old wolf dog would just fight them off. Also, the neighbor's homes are very far apart too. Then, the thought occurred to me that my own dogs were not barking. 
They should be going mad right now, considering that there was something so close. The only conclusion that I could come to was that it must be Kida, since sometimes she'll bark when she wants inside, but something had to be very wrong with her. I go downstairs, and I open my front door and call out to her to come inside, and the sound stops. And then, in its place, I, I hear these claw marks on the deck just booking it in the other direction. And then a huge shadow just bolts across the yard. It was too dark for me to see much more, and my window was on the other side of the house, and then I just went inside because I was way too scared. I hear my dog barking in the trees in a completely different direction, and she must have been off on a deer-infested adventure while this happened or something. So then... <sighs> What was that howling under my window? My sister came downstairs to ask me what I was doing, and when I told her about the sound, she said that she heard it too. But only a little bit as she was waking up, and she would not have remembered it if I didn't remind her. What's even scarier, though, is the fact that our front door was broken at the time, so whatever it was, it could have just simply pushed its way in if it wanted to. I'm grateful it didn't come to that, and we've since fixed our lock, that's for sure. Let me know what you guys think, because I'm kind of perplexed with this one. And I'm really grateful for any insight that you guys may have. So I experienced something in my childhood home that I still can't explain to this day. My mum and sister and I lived in this house from when I was four until I moved out as an adult. And I had two experiences in this house, and this is the first one. The layout of the house was such that the only way to reach the kitchen or back door was to walk through the dining room and into a small hallway. Around the age of 12, I suddenly began to feel uh, very uneasy in this hallway, particularly at night or when I was alone. I had never been afraid of this house before, even in the dark, and I just couldn't explain why this hallway just suddenly made me feel so uncomfortable. Now, the main problem with this was that we had two small dogs who slept in my room at night, and it had uh, become my responsibility to let them out into our fenced-in backyard for one last potty break every night before I went to bed. This meant that I had to let them out on my own when it was dark, and to do this... I had to walk through that hallway to reach the back door. I started turning on every light leading up the hallway, then letting the dogs out and running back to the dining room to wait for a few minutes. Then I would let them back in, lock the door, turn off the lights and just run back to my room. I couldn't walk through the hallway in the dark without feeling like I was just in a, a great deal of danger, even though it had never bothered me in the past. But... This feeling grew over the course of several months and I tried to talk to my mum about it but she said that I was just being silly and it was just all in my head. It eventually got so bad that I couldn't force myself to go back there alone at night to let the dogs out and I started taking them out into our unfenced front yard instead. I wasn't supposed to be doing that at all but standing outside alone in the dark with the possibility of getting into tons of trouble with my mum was a just a way better option than walking into that hallway. The feeling of fear was just so intense there that I was terrified. I had also stopped wanting to go there during the day, which meant that I also couldn't get into the kitchen. I started just choosing to be hungry because I refused to go in there to feed myself. My mum would cook occasionally, but I had no issue with telling us that it's left overnight, heat something up, or just us having us grab some cereal or something. But as the feeling grew, even during the day, I was just too afraid to go through the hallway to the kitchen. So sometimes on the weekends or evenings, I, I just didn't eat. Luckily for me, I, I was able to eat breakfast and lunch at school, so I wasn't starving or anything. But this went on for about a month, and then one morning it just kind of changed. I was getting ready for school, my sister was still asleep and my mum was in the kitchen and I heard my mum scream my name and the way she yelled for me, my stomach dropped. I panicked and I thought she must have cut off her finger or something or hurt herself really badly. I ran straight into the kitchen, figuring it was an emergency and when I got there, she was just standing there looking at the kitchen door that I had just walked through 
with her face just completely white. I asked what was wrong and she didn't really answer. She asked me if anyone had been in there and I replied no since my sister was asleep and I had been on the other side of the house and I was just super confused at this point. She said that she had been packing her lunch and had turned around and seen someone standing in the hallway through the kitchen door. And to this day she won't tell me who or what she saw. If I bring it up she says that she doesn't remember but... The way she acts about it and how quickly she tries to just change the subject makes me think that she does and that she just doesn't want to talk about it. She wouldn't really tell me much at the time either, which was really weird. Now, the really odd thing is that I was never afraid of that hallway again after that. You'd think that after knowing that my mum saw something that had her so upset that I would be even more afraid, but to be honest, I, I just felt a little smug about it. I had told her that there was something in that hallway, and after she saw it, the feeling just totally disappeared. It was almost like the energy or whatever built and built until it made itself seen, that it was just gone. And until I moved out of that house as an adult, I was never afraid of that hallway or anywhere else in that house again, even though I had just spent months so afraid of it that I wouldn't even go through it to feed myself. To this day, I, I still don't know why all of this happened or what it was, but I don't think that I'll ever forget it, that's for sure. One night just this year, I was home alone with my brother and we shared a room and slept on a bunk bed, him on the top bunk and me below, and before we slept I reminded him to lock the bedroom door and turn off the lights, which I watched him do. Now, I have no idea how much time passed, but I was later awakened by just a, a very loud noise, and it sounded like a, a horn or a trumpet blasting inside of my head. I know that sounds weird, but it's the only way that I can explain it. The closest comparison is the sound from the sky, which caused hysteria last year. I woke up scared and panicking and ran to the window thinking it could have been a nearby truck but quickly realized that we live somewhere that that would be impossible and the streets were completely empty. But with a sound that loud I expected other people in the neighborhood to wake up and check out what the hell that was but it seemed like I was the only person who heard it. I sat on my bed with my heart beating out of my chest and I was ready to dismiss it as a case of exploding head syndrome or simply a dream until I heard my brother's voice asking, did you hear that, the trumpet? I said yes and he said that he swore that he heard it inside of his head. He said, didn't we sleep with the lights off? Why is it on now? He's 21 and built like a tank but was shaking pretty hard at this point. We sat on our beds, both wide-eyed with terror of the something unknown. And suddenly, we were both in a, a state of trance. I stopped talking mid-sentence and we both just stared blankly at the door. We were both convinced that something not human was behind that door and we just felt watched. We felt warned. I remember feeling just so foggy too, so slow and suddenly really sleepy and exhausted. Like a flick of a switch, our adrenaline rush and intense fear was just replaced with the inexplicable and irresistible urge to go to sleep. And we obediently did. When we woke up, the first thing we did was check if the door had been unlocked. And no, it wasn't. Next was to check every inch of our bodies. But my brother was so shaken the next few days to the point that he actually asked our uncle, a radiologist, to check him for any sort of implant. He doesn't like to talk about it and get super scared and dodgy when we bring it up too. And after that night, I just have never felt safe since. Even though we have no idea what happened, the event just left me feeling permanently helpless and violated to some degree. Have any of you guys ever experienced anything like this? In 2014, I was home alone and my then boyfriend, now husband, was at work as I happened to have a very rare day off. 
I was watching the Golden Girls as I snuggled up with our two cats and relaxed. I remember feeling a, a strange and just really dreadful feeling and so I sat up from the couch and noticed a man with a, a shaggy and greasy long hair. He seemed to make eye contact with me too, even though he was roughly two blocks away. And then, he suddenly just broke out into a sprint. I felt this moment in every inch of my body too, and I rushed to the front porch and locked the screen door before rushing back into the house and locking the main door leading into the house. And then, he was suddenly at the side of our house, just punching and kicking the side window of our home as he screamed these inaudible screams. It was really freaky, and... Either he was opening his mouth and not making sounds, or I don't know, I don't know what he was doing, but it was terrifying. I was shocked as I just stared at him, and suddenly he lunged off to the side, and I realized that the side door might have also been unlocked, so I ran to our side door and caught it right as I saw his face appear in the tiny door window. I began to cry as I locked it before running into our spare bedroom, and I whipped out my cell phone and dialed 911 as I cried and tried to explain the issue. For some reason, the story in my memory just kind of skips to my upstairs neighbor calling me about five minutes later. I don't know if I just blocked it out or, or what, but I can't remember much. But he began telling me what happened after I hit. Apparently, the man had run up to his apartment and knocked calmly, so he answered. He had no way of knowing that the person at this door was the guy that I was dealing with and obviously was not of sound mind, and I didn't have enough time and thought to have warned him. He opened his door, leaving only a thin screen between him and this man, and he asked the man if everything was okay. To which, the man began screaming, they're trying to kill me, help. He was shocked and backed up and said, please step back, I'll call the police. By then, I was downstairs dialing already, and the man punched his door and ran downstairs, kicking and punching his car in the driveway as he screamed about being chased and on the verge of being murdered or something. He pulled at the car doors and punched at the windows as he just screamed and I begged the police to arrive faster. The police finally showed up as the man was still punching the neighbor's car and they brought along an ambulance and they took the man away and strapped him to a stretcher in the back. Whether that guy was actually in trouble or not or was on drugs or was just trying to get into a house, I'm still not sure to this day. All I know is that I'm really glad that... I locked those doors when I did. A couple of nights ago, after my Dungeons and Dragons club meeting, I walked down to my house. We lived in the same neighborhood, so it only took a minute, and it was around 5pm. After I got home, I really wanted to take a shower because this guy in the club did some... Uh, some questionable things with his hands and you know I don't want that touching me like ever so I just jumped in the shower immediately. Now this is where things got just really weird and I know that this is going to sound strange. So after 10 minutes or so I prefer to take long showers because depression and I'm lonely and all that. I hear a, a thud I immediately turn to face where I heard the thud and see the shampoo bottle fell off the glass shelf. So of course, being an idiot, I just decided, hey it's nothing, probably just the wind, and just kind of went back to my shower thoughts. After a minute or so, I peered to my left and I saw a, a pitch black arm emerge from the edge of the bathtub, and it just knocks down another shampoo bottle and recedes back into the crevice. At this point, I am done with all of this, and just immediately turn off the shower and run up the stairs into my room butt naked and lock the door. I live alone, so thankfully no one saw anything. And I haven't actually taken a shower since then. This is something that happened to me as a toddler, and my family told me about this a few years ago. I was just too young to really remember much, but there are some parts of the story that I distinctly remember. So, I had a nanny who would take care of me. My mum's pregnancy took a toll on her and she became really sick, so she had to go and get treatment abroad while my first year was with my dad and my sister and nanny. 
When she came back, the same nanny was taking care of me, and she stayed with us for a few years, up until I was in preschool. She and I were really close, too. Like, really close. I can remember her distinctly, and there are even images in our photo book of me and her. My mum says that I wouldn't refer to her as my mother anymore, and I'd stay away from her to be with my nanny. Also, my mum's illness made her emotionally really weak at the time, so apparently the nanny would tell me to ignore my mum and she wouldn't let my sister be around me or anything like that. Also, uh, I live in a country where labour is cheap and having stay-in or full-time helpers is pretty common here. Anyway, I just remember being attached to her constantly. She kept treating my mum and sister really bad, but they just didn't have the heart to fire her because of just how attached I was. However, my uncle and his family were in town visiting us and he got so mad at the way that she treated my mum that he fired her on the spot and made her leave the house. I vividly remember crying my eyes out and running after the nanny to the lift of our apartment and my cousins had to actually pull me back. It was pretty bad. So the crazy part is that after all of this my parents found a a lemon with pins stuck in it and a phrase written in her native language on this piece of um, parchment paper and it was in some room at our house. And we basically found out that she'd been going to a, a shaman or something, a dark magic priest is what she called it, and casting spells so that I would forget who my mum was and think the nanny was my mum, in order to kidnap me and keep me as a own. Before you think that I'm lying and this is all made up, I actually live in an Asian country that has a large dark magic culture. It's really covert, but everyone knows about it. It's scary to think too that if my uncle wasn't there, she probably would have taken me away since she lived at home and slept in my room and I would have been raised in a completely different way. I also feel a little bit bad because she probably felt like I was her son, but yeah... This was definitely not the way to go. This takes place maybe a, a year after my first real scare at the motel that my mother was managing. It was the summer of 2012 and I was uh, about 12 I think. I had just recently switched bedrooms with my parents so I was now at the back of the house and the room that I was in had previously been a part of the motel. I think it was the fourth room. The old owners had decided to knock down the wall to connect it to the hallway in the house. This room, as a, a kid, was a complete luxury. It had its own bathroom, sink, and a door leading to the outside parking lot too. People, however, often mistaked my room as the one next to it that wasn't connected and would try to get in. This was pretty much whatever at the time because most of the time I just kept it locked tight almost always but it did freak me out the first time it happened and i was in the room now the door leading outside had a, a little patch of grass in front of it that was perfectly shaded so it made up for anything that i had to deal with or, or that's what i thought anyways i loved it so much in fact that i dedicated myself to reading out there almost every day i specifically remember reading the hunger games and the maze runner series and i was just loving it one day though, I was sitting out there for almost the entire day until dinner. When my mum came and got me, I packed up my stuff and went to my room and I was so excited to eat that I just completely forgot to lock the door. I remembered this halfway to the kitchen and told myself that I would lock it when I got back. Dinner passes and my family decided to watch a movie together and after it was about nine I think, when my parents decided to go to bed, I figured that I should too and skipped down the hall to my room. I wasn't completely tired though, so I turned my old hand-me-down box TV on for noise and dug up my old laptop. I played games for an hour until I felt my eyes get heavy and I turned everything off and I laid down to go to sleep. I don't know what time it was when I woke up, but when I did, I just felt off. I was facing the wall, eyes closed, my back to the rest of the room. The TV was still on, so I thought when I heard a, a soft voice. It was someone talking. To who or what, I, I didn't know, but it sounded different. 
I wanted to open my eyes and figure out what it was, and I figured that I was already awake. Why not watch something until I was tired again? So I slowly opened my groggy eyes and realized that the TV wasn't on at all. It was complete darkness clouding my room. But I still heard whispering and now a, a metal clicking sound. I was now kind of scared and I didn't know what was happening. To confirm that the TV was definitely off, I turned over and the room was black. A small stream of light was coming through the window from the street light though and everything seemed normal. Except that there was a, a woman's voice ringing in my ears and I turned fully and sat up. Maybe I was just imagining it. I mean, it was so quiet that I wasn't sure that maybe it was just a ringing in my ears or something. But right at that second, the clicking in the voice just came to a dead stop. I froze at this point and slowly... My door leading outside started to open. It creaked for what seemed like forever until it just flung open. And in the doorway, a woman stood. I couldn't see her face or clothes and she was covered in complete shadow and she started whispering again. And at this point, I just screamed and as soon as I did, she bolted. I started crying and my parents ran into my room asking what happened and I was barely able to get it out. I was petrified. My dad went outside to see if anyone was still there while an outside cop car pulled into the parking lot, rolled down its window and asked my dad if he had seen a woman running in our lot. He told him what I was able to get out and the cop got out and began to search the property. My mum had moved me to the living room at this point and had managed to almost calm me down and I sat there forever with her, not really knowing what to do. It was maybe only 20 minutes when a different cop came to the door and told us that they actually caught her hiding in our garage. Apparently, she had run there after and was trying to crawl beneath a car that we had parked in there. But the worst part? They found meth, a knife, some cash, and a rubber band on her, and he wanted to talk to me to get the full story, and I told the cop everything. I was actually really grateful, and he was nice, and went on reassuring me that I was safe now. He didn't believe that she would have done anything. She was so wrecked, apparently, that they couldn't make out a single word, and they just arrested her and left. But I'm not so sure, because she was definitely alert when she opened that door. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night, or many nights after that. I'll admit, too, to even asking to sleep in my parents' bed for a long time because I was so scared. But nothing like that ever happened again, but I'll remember it forever. It just felt like a nightmare come to life without anything actually happening. I'm thankful that nothing happened, and I'm thankful that it's not as bad as some stories that I've heard here, but boy, was it creepy. I'm 22 now, but this story is from when I was around 6 or 7. We've since then moved, but I remember my old house being somewhat creepy. I used to share a room with my sister too, and at least once a month I would get this terrifying repeat nightmare, and I still remember it in vivid detail. The nightmare would begin with me entering a massive ballroom with black and white checkered tiles. The room would be so large that I could never see the other side. As I would be looking around, this girl in a plaid skirt and button-down shirt, that looked to me like a private school outfit maybe, would start walking towards me. She had pitch black hair that fell in front of her face. She would walk really slow and all of a sudden, her face would just shoot up and look at me with a, a terrifying smile. She would run at me while yelling that I have to finish my laps before she finishes her song. At this point, a grand piano would show up and she would start playing this song on it. All I would realize at the time is that I had to run and so I did. But to my horror, my legs are heavy as metal and I can barely manage to take a step or two before she finishes her song. At this point, she starts circling me with blood all over her face yelling, you know what you did, you'll pay for it. And at this point, I would always wake up. But strangely, even when I wake up, I can still hear the piano music clear as day. Like, 
It's coming from a radio right next to my head on full volume. Well, as I said, I would have this dream at least once a month and I would wake up screaming bloody murder every time. This one night though, I remember that I just couldn't sleep for the life of me. My sister was asleep in the bed next to me and I'd been laying there occupying myself for the past few hours and everyone was asleep in my house so it was pretty quiet. When all of a sudden I look over to my sister and at the foot of her bed is a girl. She's turned away from me and is flipping pages of a book. And as soon as I notice her, she stops flipping the page and looks up from her book. She starts to spin her head around past the point of normal and it's bent at a just an unnatural angle, which is when I notice that it's the same girl from my dream. She was also glowing in this light and everything in me wanted to scream, but instead I, I throw my blanket over my head and close my eyes trying to stay still. After about a minute or two, I peeked out again, and instead of at the end of my sister's bed, she's now hanging on the wall beside me with her eyes wide open. I scream, and at this point, my parents come running in, and she just disappears right before my eyes. We actually moved house not too long after that, and once we moved, I thought I was going to continue to have the nightmare, but I only had it once in the new house, or our current house actually, and... It was the exact same, but in an odd way. She almost seemed desperate in this dream. Like she lost her grasp on me or something, and it's just hard to describe. At this time, when I woke up, I could still hear the music, but she was also on the wall across from me, hanging with a just a very angry look on her face. And since then, I have not had the nightmare again. But my family still thinks that I was dreaming to this day, but... To me, it, it felt real, and it was the most terrifying years of my entire life so far. In sixth grade, I'm a senior now, I had a friend, and her name was Jenny. I grew up outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, near New Cumberland in a borough called Lemoyne, and the streets are very close together and everyone lives near one another and Jenny was no exception. I would walk over to her house and watch telly or anime with her as kids do and I don't remember exactly how the topic of her ghost came up but we were all very invested in the paranormal at the time. Jenny, me and our whole slew of friends. Now, if you've ever been to Lemoyne, you would know that most of the houses are old and were added on, refurbished, remodeled, expanded, etc. And most of these old houses are now townhouses. I think this is why Jenny had two closets. One closet was always closed for the most part. It was deep and it was always dark. But the closet that Jenny actually used to hold her clothes was on the opposite end of the room. This is why she never used the first closet... And Jenny's room was always really cold, kind of unnaturally so in fact, and the door would open and close often and it just generally just didn't feel right. Jenny also had shelves across the length of her room and on those shelves were just the creepiest porcelain dolls, still in their boxes too, heirlooms from one of her old relatives I think, I never asked for specifics, and the dolls would actually move in their boxes sometimes. They would kind of turn one way or the other, and always when we weren't looking, too. We'd reposition just enough for us to note a definite change in their pose, and it was spooky as hell. Jenny called her ghost Mandy, too, and said that she was a little girl. Jenny also had a younger sister, probably three or four at the time, and Mandy hated her. She would actually be scratched frequently, too. If her sister was in the room with us, we would be scratched, too, and... We wouldn't notice them until later because they didn't actually hurt, but I think they hurt her sister sometimes. They were on our arms for the most part too. It looks like someone clawed us and it looks like they were scabbed over in the way that cuts do after a couple of hours. And always three of them. I think Jenny's sister got them on her back one time too and they were a lot less superficial that time. And it got so bad that Jenny's mum forbade Jenny's sister from going in that room. Now, I had a phone back in 2012, one of those phones with the full keyboard that you turn on its side and kind of slide up. I took a picture of Jenny's open closet once and 
Unfortunately, I, I no longer have the picture as the phone is probably in a landfill, but it clearly showed a girl's face partially hidden by the clothes Jenny had hanging up in that closet. But mostly fancy stuff and her dad's old suits and whatnot, but there were eyes, nose, lips, hair and the whole nine yards. It was just her face, but it was peeking out, almost shyly, and there wasn't any real malice in her gaze. Not that I remember, and she was just there. But Jenny's ghost kind of became common knowledge among our friend group too, so we decided to have a sort of uh, a junior seance, so to speak. I think there were seven other people that came over for this, and it was a whole planned event, but we knew better than to bring a Ouija board, and seven people plus Jenny and I, so I think there were nine total. We agreed to go into the closet in shifts. Six would go in at once, and then four would exit, and the others would enter, and since there wasn't a whole lot of room, it was big, but not big enough to hold nine 11 to 12 year olds at once. And a couple of our friends fancied themselves psychics, and it was all very juvenile, and we were pretty excited though. I was one of the three who wasn't inside the closet at the time. Convenient, I know, but bear with me. And the other two and I were pressing our ears to the door to hear what they were saying, when all of a sudden, we hear screaming, and they're beating down the door, bowling us over, scrambling out of there. Now, apparently, one of the girls who believed that she could talk to ghosts placed her iPhone 3 or 4 or whatever it was she had on a little shelf in the closet and said, if you're in here with us, move this phone, or something to that effect. According to another friend who was in the closet, she had to repeat it a couple of times. It was all very muffled and the door was really thick and we couldn't really make out what they were saying, which is why we didn't hear what happened until they started screaming. And before the psychic friend could finish asking again, the phone apparently chucked itself across the closet and smashed into the wall, like someone had thrown it. And that's when they came out. But needless to say, we were all well and spooked and decided to just call it a night at this point. And we never really spoke about Mandy again after that. My friend Jenny's ghost is something that I still struggle to explain to this day. I mean, sure, maybe those girls made the whole thing up. But those scratches, I definitely saw them with my own eyes, and they were not on our bodies before we went in that room. So, this happened to me a while back, and though I've tried to find it again, I, I never have. I live in a trailer park and right next to it is this uh, wooded area with drainage ditches and such. I was walking through it one day and I heard ahead of me and to my left what sounded like a, a little girl screaming. I didn't really take much notice of this as in that direction there was another housing area. However, it did strike me as odd when I heard another scream from the opposite direction on the other side of the ditch this time. I slowed down some after this and was considering whether I wanted to go any further when yet another scream occurred, but this time it was right in front of my face. I jumped backwards some and it may have made a rather high pitched noise and immediately turned around to make my way home. And this was followed by the sound of little girls laughter from right behind me and the sound of something following me. And when I looked over my shoulder, I noticed rocks and stuff being moved as if something was walking there. At this point, I was absolutely spooked and I moved as quickly as I could to just get out of the wooded area and to the road so that I could run back to my house. The noises of whatever was following me kept up right until I got out of the woods and ran straight back to my house. I have no idea what that was and if anyone has any ideas, I'm, I'm all ears. I moved to Brompton around the age of 10 years old. We had moved from a city to this quaint medieval village with trees, ponds, streams and fields and honestly couldn't have been more excited. The village itself has a number of ghost stories, including its own buried village with graves from the old village still in the old church. However, no one told the stories of the West End where we had moved and it's amazing the amount of activity that's there. 
here, I want to detail the events which lasted around a 10 year period from age of 9 to 19 while I lived in there. So to begin, I just kind of always knew that there was a suicide of a previous owner in our house. My parents actually sat me down angry one day and asked who told me that and I kept telling them that no one told me. I just knew and despite them knowing my previous history, it still took them a while to actually believe me. I also refused to go into my parents' room down the hallway. I hated that room because Mr. Morley, the previous owner, he'd actually ended his life in there. When my parents were angry that someone had told me, then a child, this information, they sat me down and demanded to know who shared this information and why, and I repeatedly told them that no one had told me. I just knew somehow. Somehow I just knew that Mr. Morley had taken his life in that room and I felt his darkness forever in there. Strangely, there has been a number of suicides and mysterious illnesses linked to the property and the people who have lived there, a fact not escaped by my own family. Another incident was the old man. My brother Lawrence was just hysterical. I've never seen anyone then or since as frightened as I saw him that night. He couldn't speak for at least a few hours and he was shaking with fear, eyes wide. It was fear to the level that you're worried that he was going to need medical attention if his heart wouldn't stop racing and his breathing wouldn't settle down. Apparently, uh, an old man in a flat cap and a, a brown woolly jumper appeared in his room and just stood there staring at him. My brother didn't recognize the man and he never appeared to him again. Another incident was the running spirits. You would hear it loudly and pretty regularly too, and it wasn't a rare occurrence by any means. It happened all the time. You'd be the only person in the house, and you could hear loud footsteps just running at speed through the room upstairs. It wasn't soft either, like creaking floorboards or anything. This was absolutely loud pounding, running up and down the landing and in and out of rooms and just all over the place. We would sit looking up at the ceiling, wondering who it was and what they were doing, and if you thought that you were alone, you would shout up to check no one was there. This happened during the daytime and the nighttime too, but ceased if you were to ever enter the upstairs living area. I suspect that there were poltergeists there too, because on one occasion, I had a cockatiel and he would suddenly just start hissing and become scared of something. We would often look up at the same time at something unseen in the room, and the bird would just go crazy like whatever it was was approaching it. It was normal in my bedroom to see things just thrown across the room too and I could be sitting there and the next thing just look up to see a toy or a book being slung across the other side of the room. But this would also occur even more frequently when my friend Matthew visited who also seems to attract and energize the spirits or something. On one occasion a, a puzzle on my bookshelf lifted up into the air and then was just thrown across the room and immediately after this the two balls in my table football started rolling up and down the pitch, literally like something from a movie. This wasn't exclusive to my bedroom though. I was once stood in the outbuilding when I turned around with my mother and we both saw a, a plastic bowl that chickens drank out of just hovering and shaking in midair around five foot up before suddenly dropping to the ground. I used to feel this thing too would just follow me for years and it actually used to disturb me. It wasn't a positive kind of feeling and I could feel it behind me when I walked, always watching, always just feeding or something. On one occasion my friend Sam who had come over made a noise and looked petrified at something and apparently in the corner of the room Sam saw clearly a little girl crouching down just staring up at him in an old dress. Strangely enough, I, I never saw this little girl myself in all the years that I lived there, but he was the only one to see it. Sam's twin brother Dave, though, continuously mocked his brother for claiming that he'd seen a ghost. To Dave, there was never such a thing, and the idea in itself was just ridiculous. One day, Dave picked me up from my house because well, we were about to go clubbing, and we both stepped out of the house and looked up as a, a cloudy fog was moving across the yard which then took the form of a tall woman in robes just striding across the yard with purpose. But this stunning residual ghost then turned back into smoke and just fizzled out as it reached the road. I woke my mum up to tell her when I returned, excited with the news, and her answer was, thank God someone else saw it. I thought I was going mad. Apparently, 
But my mum had actually seen this too. Now, I wanted to save this one for last because it's something that, and excuse the pun, has haunted me my entire life. So I was stood in the yard doing a chore for my mum one day and I just heard suddenly someone running behind me. Then I felt the wind as a, a figure just ran straight past me as close as it possibly could without touching me. It was sprinting and it was a figure and it was roughly the same size as a human but completely black almost like a solid shadow but what i'll never forget was the feeling that i got from this thing it was just pure evil and dripping with hate was this the reason that the building was linked to so many suicides i don't know but whatever it was i hope i never see it again I'm going to preface the accounting of the weird ghostly things that have happened in my house so far with a request. Please don't try to warn me of the dangers or give me any suggestions to get rid of my ghost. I don't really believe in these kinds of things and I'd love to believe but I just don't. If my ghost is real I intend to keep it. It's a little contact to a world that I'd love to believe is real. If things get really bad I may seek advice then, but so far, it's just a few stories and I thought you guys might get a kick out of some. So here we go. I moved to an old spacey apartment last year and I'm living there with my girlfriend and my two sons, age 7 and 1, who share a room. So one night, I'm tucking the oldest one in and he decides he needs to go to the bathroom, as boys trying to postpone bedtime usually try to do. And so, I hide under his covers to mess with him. I hear him walk into the room and he sits at the feet of his bed and I can feel the pressure on the mattress. He doesn't say anything, asks nothing about why I'm all covered up and it was a bit weird and so I go boo and he isn't there. He comes back from the bathroom two minutes later but at this point I'm just too weirded out to boo him and try and scare him again. A few days later, I tell this story to my wife and she tells me that she also had a weird experience in their bedroom too. The baby was already asleep and she was negotiating sleep with the older one when suddenly she hears footsteps and sees the shadow of the baby running away to the living room. She gets up to follow him and then notices the baby is still in his bed, sound asleep. About two months later, one of those nights when baby wins and gets to stay in our room, Around 4am, the 7 year old also comes into our room and we ask him what's wrong and he says the baby, who's been sleeping soundly all night next to us, has been crying all night and he can't sleep. Well, we let him sleep in our room and we don't say anything about the baby not being in their room. Now, with the final story, my girlfriend lost her mother a long time ago. Nevertheless, she's still very attached to her, carries a picture of her everywhere. And one day, she decided to put a little altar to her mother in our living room and she placed a picture of her, lit a candle and offered an apple. Now, we're not Mexican, so she did what she saw in the movies, Coco, but there's a detail that she didn't know and we were told it later. Mexicans, they light special candles that smoke but make no flame for this occasion. Smoke guides the spirit of loved ones but fire may attract unwanted attention apparently. And while we were watching this, the whole altar just flew from its place, one thing at a time too. First the apple, then the picture, and then the candle, like something was throwing them. There was a second or two between throws, and so it's not that something lost its balance and everything just fell. My son actually ate the apple later too. As stated in the story, I'm not Mexican, so I know nothing about these things. But what I share here about this is just what I've been told, but I don't know how accurate that is, and if something about this is wrong, I apologize for it. I don't mean any offense. So I kind of just want to share this in case anyone else has ever seen something similar. I've experienced my fair share of negative energies in my time, but never something that I'd consider calling demonic. Not even sure I believe in demons, to be honest, which makes this whole thing just 
even weirder for me. So a bit of history about me and my knowledge of the paranormal world. I actually have a paranormal team in the UK and I have for years. And over the years we've gone through doing public ghost hunts where members of the public come out with you to only doing private team stuff and had a bunch of team members come and go and some we trusted and some we just didn't. We've investigated hundreds of locations in the UK, most of which have been fairly quiet. If you've ever done a proper paranormal investigation, 90% of nights are dead, if you'll excuse the pun. I'm fairly well experienced and I'm not the kind of person to go, oh my goodness it's a ghost, when I see a, a lot of orbs or dust or something in a photo, or if I hear a creak in an old building with wood floors or something. But with that said, this is my story. So we were doing a public ghost hunt at a place called Dudley Castle a few years ago now. This venue has always been the most active location we've ever visited with so much stuff happening every time we went that we'd always go back. But this particular time it was coming up to the end of the night so while Al, at the time, medium was talking to the guests and doing a bit of vigil, the team went to pack up, roll up all the camera wires and collect any trigger objects that we left around the castle and all that sort of stuff and we went back into the Undercroft where the entire group of guests were. Now, there are two stone coffins in the Undercroft and when people lay in these coffins, they sometimes feel breathless, like someone is pressing on their chest. So, there were two guests that sat in them who volunteered to lay in them and see if they felt anything. At the front of the room, there was our medium and three guests sat at the table doing a small seance. The rest of the guests were sat in the church pews that are in this room just observing. The team filed in around the edges and a few of us were filming with night vision handhelds. The seance wasn't crazy active but one of the guests said that he felt like his face was burning. He described it as the feeling after being slapped. We asked if he was okay and he said that he was fine and that was that. The seance ended and the people in the stone coffins got up and one of them was saying that his chest was tight. We shouted for the lights to be turned on, health and safety and all that and when they went on... There was a gasp from across the room. The gentleman who had been slapped during the seance actually had three scratches down his face. They weren't human fingernail size too and they almost looked like a, a cat swiped his face or something. Like really thin lines down his face. They were bleeding slightly too and we had to administer official first aid as an incident on site. The weird thing is... He never touched his face the entire time as we had multiple cameras covering the room even in the dark. There is actually the footage of this on YouTube too. I don't have the full night's video as this is from years ago now but the scratches in the video is still on YouTube. Anyway, as we went off to the base room to be cleaned up we all just kind of sat and did some calling out and to see if any of our equipment could be affected. During this period of time I was stood closest to one of the now empty stone coffins in the corner and... I could just feel something, feel that there was something next to me. It was pitch black and yet somehow this thing was darker than the darkness. I could only look at this thing out of the corner of my eye and I struggle to explain this bit so I'm sorry if it doesn't make any sense but you know when you can see something out of the corner of your eye and it's just kind of there moving but not a clear image? Well, even when I was looking directly at it, it was still like I was just looking at it from my peripheral, even though I knew I was at this point facing it. I have no mediumship or psychic ability, uh, aside from maybe building natural sensitivity over my years of exposure to the paranormal, yet somehow I, I think I was seeing this thing in my mind's eye a little or something. Even though it wasn't completely an image, I could see it kind of skulking around in the darkness by me, kind of like um, a cross between how a dog would move and how Gollum would move in The Lord of the Rings. Like I said, it was dense black, even in the darkness. It was small, much smaller than a human. It had a human shape, but not quite, and it actually reminded me of a, a Heartless from Kingdom Hearts, if anyone's ever seen that. The face, from what I could make out from the incomplete image of it, was almost goatee. It looked like it had a resemblance to a human, but with very harsh features. I think uh, a Bram Stoker's Dracula logo, but uh, a bit less vampiric, a bit more animalistic. So, obviously, I, I stood there feeling incredibly uncomfortable. I wasn't even scared, it was just a, a really strange emotion that I was feeling. 
I whispered to the two team members next to me if they'd swap places with me, and I didn't say why, just moved two places down. My teammate, Elle, was now stood where I was, with a space and then a coffin next to him. I noticed him over the next few minutes, too, just shuffling and turning his head every now and then, but he's a massive skeptic and outright refused to speak to anyone after that night about what he did or didn't feel when he stood there. Years later, he still hasn't talked about it, and I wonder if he had the same experience as me. Anyway, so skip a year or so and we're hosting the official Halloween weekend for the castle. It's two nights, a Friday and a Saturday night over Halloween weekend. A few strange things happened there too. Long story short, our medium was possessed or overshadowed or whatever you want to call it and this wasn't a regular occurrence for him and it actually really upset me to witness it. There was something just too totally not right about the situation and I truly don't believe he was faking it. Another team member on a later date got possessed too, and that one I, I didn't believe actually. So, I've seen what I believe to be a real and a fake possession. Anyway, so that happened and we got him sorted out and whatnot and made sure that he was okay and trod carefully the rest of the weekend. We captured an image of something on our camera system. Our camera actually fell over and when we picked it up you could see this face in a window. A team member is adamant that it was a cat, but I don't know if I believe that. I mean, it looked like exactly what I saw in the Undercroft two years previously. She won't budge on her opinion that it was a cat, and I don't have the raw footage to check it out, unfortunately. That night, though, I was driven home, and I actually passed out in the car. The person who was driving thought that I fell asleep, but actually, I, I took a funny turn. And never in my life has this happened to me, too. I woke up at my house, got out and made it into my room and into bed and now I have to admit that uh, I'm actually a bit of a wimp. I know it's hilarious considering I'm a, a paranormal investigator but at the time I was the kind of person who put a Disney film on and slept with the lights on after a ghost hunt and if I was home alone I wouldn't sleep full stop. So I was home alone and just felt completely at ease and almost blissful at the time which was kind of out of character for me. I lay in bed and I could hear someone walking up and down my stairs, moving around outside of my bedroom door and then going back downstairs. And I know that there was nobody home and it wasn't just the floorboards creaking or anything. Someone was definitely outside of my door and I actually passed out again and woke up in the morning right as rain. A year passed and we had another investigation booked at the castle and we hadn't been back for about a year at all at this point. I didn't have anything happen at all in my house since that night too and I had just kind of consciously forgotten about it all. I packed my gear up and someone arrived to pick me up and the second I stepped out of my front door it just kind of hit me. I just felt terrible like I was going to pass out and felt almost feverish. We met up with the team though at the pub outside the zoo gates and I couldn't eat and I spoke to our medium and said that I was concerned and he told me to speak to him a bit later in the night if I uh, don't feel well still and he'll try to white light me. Apparently a, a spiritual cleanse. I don't actually 100% believe in that stuff but I was willing to try anything at this point. But we walked up the hill, still feeling like death mind you, and I walked through the archway into the castle courtyard and the feeling just totally lifted and I felt free again, healthy and totally fine. And after that, I, I didn't feel the slightest bit ill for the rest of the night too and I haven't felt like that since. I know that this is going to sound crazy, but it's almost like something attached to me and ended up coming home with me and couldn't get back or something. And when I was going back to the castle, it reattached to me as I stepped outside so I'd take it home or something and left me again as soon as I entered the castle grounds. I know it's going to sound ridiculous to some people, and if another person told me this story, I'd be like, yeah, right, buddy. I'm that type of person that constantly tries to find logical explanations and faults in people's paranormal experiences, but I can only tell you what I felt, and it just wasn't right. Anyway, yeah. Uh, if you've stuck with me this far, I'd like to hear any thoughts that you may have or any experiences that may be similar. Thanks. I've always wanted to experience something paranormal as I'm actually very interested in it, but I've never had anything happen. 
Up until this year, that is. So I work at a very old university with castles and gothic-looking buildings, and both of my paranormal experiences have been at or on the way to work there. So the first time I was going into the animal facility at around 9pm, it was already dark, and there was a locker room and then a changing room before you open the door into a long hallway with the laboratory animal rooms. I go into the changing room and I hear a, a loud kind of ah noise just over and over, rhythmically, coming from the hallway. I figure it's some sort of alarm, but when I open the door into the hallway and can hear it better, it's definitely a woman's scream coming at consistent but irregular intervals, so not an alarm. I peer down the hallway and notice that I'm definitely alone and there's no woman and nothing there and I'm scared at this point but according to the rules you can't go back into the changing room once you've entered the hallway so I pushed open the door to the animal room and the screaming just immediately stopped. After doing my work I have to go into an adjacent hallway to exit and as soon as I enter the screaming starts again, definitely coming from the first hallway and at this point, I just bolted out of there. The second thing that happened was uh, sometimes I have to work odd hours there, being a laboratory scientist and all, and this morning at around 3am I was driving to work and everything was normal until I approached a bridge. I see a figure, a man in a suit, just standing on the top of the bridge. However, this guy is so much taller than any man could be. Probably about uh, 15 to 20 feet tall at least. As I approach the bridge to go underneath it, I, I see him turn around and I can see that he has no face, just a white oval. I go under the bridge and when I come out on the other side, I turn and look to see if he's still there and no, he's gone. So I live in the Netherlands and I've actually been reading a lot about paranormal encounters lately and... I decided that uh, I wanted to share mine. But this is the first encounter that I ever had and kind of where it all began and why my interest was piqued. And this encounter just kind of changed me. So I lived in Amsterdam and my father died when I was five years old. My mother and father were actually divorced at the time and she met someone else. His family actually lives in the north of the Netherlands and I always visited them with my parents and always stayed there for a week or a weekend. I always slept in the guest room where my father collected old little bottles of liqueurs and they were in a straight line in front of a mirror. I never felt unease or experienced something weird there but one night at 3am I just kind of woke up out of the blue and I could hear glass touching sounds like clinking. At that moment I realized the air in the room just felt really weird too. The second glass sound made me feel like I had to look into the direction of the sound and at the moment I looked, I, I froze. I could see this woman just standing in front of the mirror and the liqueurs. She was grabbing the little bottles one by one and stacking them in her other hand, which was against her belly. She was white, glowing, and was dressed in this kind of hospital white dress. She grabbed about three or four bottles, and at that moment, you could see that she noticed that she was being looked at. She turned her head towards me, and I just felt immediate fear intensifying within me. Then, she turned her shoulders facing me and she started waving at me. And this was the moment that I shouted for my grandmother. I shouted and I covered my head under the blankets and she came into the room and I told her everything. Her face told me instantly that she didn't believe me, but she just tried to comfort me anyway. The moment she left the room, I, I knew it was no use to ask for help and at that moment, I... I felt truly alone. I was looking at the ceiling thinking about what I saw and in the right corner of my eye I, I see this white glow making circles in the air. I closed my eyes and said to myself sleep and it'll all be over soon. The bed was against the wall and I didn't want to turn around because it felt safer to just know that you can look in the room. I opened my eyes and I uh, couldn't see the glow anymore which was a relief. But about a second later I I felt like there was just something behind me. And then, I felt the mattress depress, like someone was laying down right behind me. The fear was actually so intense that I passed out and I woke up hours later and 
There was nothing in the room. I'm a nurse and I graduated a little over two years ago and I'm working at a really nice place right now. This happened when I was doing my internship though at another nursing home. So I just turned 19 and I remember because my internship started a little after my birthday in August. I had come by for a talk the day before I started and was assigned to one of the nurses already working there. Her name was Louisa. Louisa had been working there for 20 plus years at this point and she was going to show me the ropes and whatnot. So there we were, walking around the building, a two-story building with several hallways that housed over 40 patients. Louisa walked me through the normal day routine and was showing me a couple of the rooms where the sheets were, how to get the meds, just boring basic nursing home stuff. When we finally got to the end of the hallway though, she kept looking at one of the doors. It was closed too, unlike the others. She opened one of the closets and continued her talk, but her gaze just kept wandering off to that door. When I finally asked why she kept looking at the door, she told me that we don't use that room and it's been closed off for a while now. She didn't want to talk about it anymore too, and at that point I just kind of let it go. A few months into my internship and I was allowed to let go of Louisa and do stuff on my own. She was still the person I went to for questions and whatnot, but I was pretty much on my own during the work hours. We all got assigned rooms during the morning report and I found myself assigned to the room next to the one that we don't use. Even though Louisa's talk got me a, a little freaked out, I'll admit. I'm not someone to back down, so I kept my mouth shut and just worked my shift. After my shift though, I went to put some stuff into the closet and when I opened the closet, I could hear a faint buzzing sound. It was distorted and a sound that you would hear if you would crumple paper over the intercom, but with buzzing mixed into it too. To be honest, I, I didn't think much of it until I remembered what Louisa had said about the room. Naturally, my curiosity got the better of me and I went to check the door was locked. Mind you, all of the doors are electrical so that in case of a fire or emergency, they shut and lock themselves. But this door? It wasn't closed. I figured it must have been broken and thought to myself that maybe that's why they don't use the room. When I opened it, the sound got louder though, but the room was empty. There was nothing in there but a pair of curtains just hanging from the ceiling and the sound came from the door. The little electric box was where the sound was coming from. It was a, a weird kind of crackling buzzy sound and I remember walking closer to it to see if I was hearing it right and the little light on the box turned on and then I could hear this moaning and groaning like someone was in pain coming from the box. Well, I never knew if I was a fight or flight person but after that I left and shut the door real quick. That night, something inside me told me that I had to know what the story was behind it, so I texted one of my classmates who was also doing her internship there, and she told me that the nurse she was assigned to had told her that the room was a gateway for the people who had passed away in the nursing home. The electric box was a, a means for them to talk to us, and the weird groaning sound was them trying to get back to us. Apparently... They don't use that room because whenever they assigned a patient to that room, they reported nightmares and weird sightings and overall just being uncomfortable and scared. I called my school the next morning and I actually got a transfer to a new internship where I still work to this day. And if you ask me if I regret doing that, not one bit. I was 12 years old at the time that this unexplained incident happened. My bedroom was the furthest room in the house and I had a sliding front door and then sliding closet doors. One of the doors, the one on the left, was broken and I had to physically pick it up and move it to the side to actually get into it. I was really fond of playing with Ouija boards alone back then because I was a very sheltered child and didn't have many friends, so I would talk to the people in the board instead. I always closed my doors at night when I was ready for bed too, and on that night, I was talking to the board and the planchette just started moving in ever increasingly fast circles. I got frightened by this and put the board away, in the left side of the closet. It was about 2.30 in the morning and I was awakened by a tapping noise. 
but my room was very still and the only pet I had was a cat and he was at my feet asleep. But my grandparents always went to bed very early and slept in the front of the house so I knew it couldn't have been them too. I rolled over and from my bed you can clearly see my closet doors. As my eyes adjusted to the dark I started to notice that the left closet door was open about half a foot. I stared wide-eyed at my closet knowing that there was just no possible way that that door would be open. It was pretty heavy and I just didn't understand because I had closed it just a few hours prior. Suddenly, as I stared into the darkness of the opening, I saw two bright yellow eyes just appear and were staring back at me. I started to tremble and wanted to scream, but I was frozen with fear. I don't remember how long I just stared into those eyes and it was like I was just transfixed or something. Then the eyes just seemed to get brighter and it was a knee-jerk reaction to pull my blanket over my head, but I did it. As a kid, that's the only thing I thought would help me in this situation. I laid there trembling for a moment under the blanket, closing my eyes tight and just hoping whatever it was would go away. I laid there under the cover until I fell asleep again and when I woke up to my alarm, I sat straight up and looked at my closet. And the door was closed. I don't play with Ouija boards alone anymore. never told anyone this or talked about it to anyone besides the people that were there with me that night and my best friend that claims to have seen him at a different date that I didn't know about until I described my experience to him. I lived in a small town in Bastrop, Louisiana with my cousin and his wife at the time. There's not much to do in Morehouse Parish besides drive back roads like we've done thousands of times before. Then, one night in 2015, we were leaving a church that we used to clean and it was around 2am or so. But we were in my cousin's 1990 GMC Sierra single cab 4x4 and we decided to ride back roads. So we were cruising, me and him are talking and listening to Nirvana probably and we played music together. But his wife was asleep in the middle seat when we turned on a paved road about 5 miles or so outside of town and came around a, a curve and there it was something that we'd never seen before and I'm an avid hunter and been in the woods all hours of the night and day and was in the army but had never been more freaked out by something than what we witnessed that night. There was something dead in the road and something was eating it and when the headlights hit it it looked up and it looked to be about two and a half to three feet tall just kneeling down there like it was kneeling over whatever it was eating and it had red eyes and it stood up so fast and it just seemed like milliseconds and then I noticed that it was about seven or eight feet tall, was pitch black and its skin looked like a, a bat skin but way darker and in one foul swoop it leapt and its wings opened and it just flew into the woods on the side of the road and it must have been moving at least 50 miles per hour. It was honestly just the wildest experience of my life and I've always been cynical when it comes to paranormal stuff but I know what I saw that night and so does my cousin and I think that we may have seen the Mothman. Several years ago my daughter and I were alone in my house. I slept upstairs and she slept downstairs. My room took up the entire top floor of the house with only one way up or down. My room was illuminated by street lights from the corner that shone into the room too. I had these pleated shades that uh, were popular in the early 2000s and I liked them because they were really private but still let in a lot of light if you catch my drift. My daughter's room was close enough to the stairwell that if I called down to her that she could hear me. The house wasn't that large and her bedroom was a little darker but was illuminated by the fish tank that she used as a headboard for her bed. So it was winter time in Florida, cool but not cold. It wasn't raining and there was no fog and it was just a routine night. My daughter went to bed a little before I did but we were both asleep by 11pm. I had to work the next day but I actually can't remember now if she had school or not the next day too. She was attending college at the time. Somewhere around 2am though, I'm awakened and not just awakened like normal but kind of jolted out of my sleep. Almost like I heard a loud noise or something but only awakened after the noise was over. I'm completely tense like I'm waiting for something and I listen and there's nothing. 
but I'm still straining to hear and suddenly I've I've just got to sit up and I bolt upright and there he is. It's a man about 5'8 wearing a red plate shirt, tucked in, blue jeans and heavy dark shoes or boots. He's about 8 feet from the end of my bed, just grinning at me. His arms are at his side and I feel like I can see him breathing but he's just grinning this weird maniacal grin and just staring at me. I completely lose it and I scream and he just stands there grinning at me and I must have closed my eyes because when I open them, he's just no longer there. And that's when I hear my daughter screaming for me. My first thought is that this guy has run down and now he's in her bedroom downstairs but it was only seconds between her calling out to me and me seeing this guy. And I mean, there's no way to get down the stairs that fast. And then I hear her say, Mom, there was a man in my bedroom. I jump out of bed and start running down the stairs and my daughter is calling out for me and I'm thinking this guy or guys are in a bedroom or somewhere in the house. I reach her bed and she's upright in bed and there's no one in her room but only two ways out. Past me and then past the stairwell and down the hall toward the front door or garage or out her sliding glass door. The glass door was still closed and I can see that so I ask her which way did he go and she says I don't know and, and now I'm thinking oh my lord they're so fast. I run down the hallway towards the living room and the kitchen, the dining room and the front door and I turn on all the lights as I go thinking that I'll find them or flush them out or something but as fast as I'm moving there's nothing and just no one there. I reach the front door and check it to see if it's unlocked and... No, it's still locked. I check all the windows and they're all closed and locked too. I check the garage door, the living room, the sliding glass doors and everything's locked just as we left it. That only leaves the sliding glass door in my daughter's bedroom and I'm running back to the bedroom thinking maybe he's in her closets, maybe he ran out the door and I just missed them and when I get there, her lights are on and she's crying like I am, scared beyond reason, and I check the closets and nothing. After just being completely confused and not understanding what the heck just happened, finally I, I sit on the bed and hold her and ask what he looked like. She said that he was wearing jeans and a plaid shirt and was just grinning at her. I tell her what I saw and, and now we're both just wondering what the hell just happened. She told me that she was already awake and had just sat up and was looking at the guy that was in her room when she heard me scream. And we saw two men at the same time wearing the same thing, both just grinning at us. It was weird. Too weird. It was a fake grin and it was just menacing and cold. I hadn't actually heard her screams because I was freaked out and screaming at the same time. It wasn't until I closed my eyes or looked away, I really don't know which, that my grinning man just disappeared and I heard her calling for me downstairs. We don't know what it was and whatever it was disappeared and we haven't seen anything like it since. I'll admit that my daughter and I have had other experiences in common, seeing some things together, calling each other at the same time and that kind of thing. We've even been robbed together once, but this particular event, it was just... Very unnerving in a way that I can't describe and I've never experienced. It was something dangerous that came into our home for both of us and just left us with no explanation whatsoever. I don't know if anyone else has had anything like this happen to them and if you have I would appreciate hearing from you. And if anyone has an explanation for this I'd love to hear that too. Anyway, thanks for listening guys and... I sure hope that nothing like this ever happens again. So right around July, I, I found a sweet deal on a place. Looked very nice and spacious, very cheap, and also provides awesome internet. It was going to be great for my first place to live. But ever since I moved in though, I've been wondering if I was perhaps wrong. Now let me explain. When I first moved in, things just started going weird. I didn't unpack for the first two days since I moved in the first day, but had a concert that night along with work, so I moved all my stuff in, but everything stayed packed except uh, sort of necessity stuff. Immediately upon coming home the next morning, I noticed something strange going on though. 
I had set my box of kitchenware in the kitchen when I moved in, so it would be easy to unpack, but when I came home from work, I saw pans just sitting on the stove. I knew that this was strange, as I went out to eat after the concert the previous night. I played it off, though, as me taking some out when I first got to the place and just forgot about this action or something. But the following night, just other mildly creepy things happened. But despite being alone, I would hear noises of other people moving around in my place. At first, I just ignored it, since I'm used to living in apartments which are connected to other places, and we hear movement in other apartments quite frequently. However, I remembered this new place isn't connected to anyone else's home, and I really shouldn't be hearing movement like this. On another night, I had washed my pans and laid them flat on the counter to dry, with rags underneath, and I woke up to a loud noise and found my pans just all over the place. One in the sink, two on the floor, and the last one on a completely separate counter. I was officially freaked out now, and these kinds of things have been going on for quite some time now. But nothing dangerous, and just mildly rare occurrences, but they did happen. But tonight, tonight was the first time that I had seen something with my own eyes. So I was sitting at home just watching videos and I started hearing people talk again, almost right in my ear this time though. I guess that maybe it was just coming from outside, but there was no one around my place and I started freaking out and I got up to get a can of pop as sugar comforts me and as I finished my drink and set it down, it just suddenly flies across the room. I freeze and then just multiple things in my living room began to be thrown around and even a candle, which thankfully hadn't been lit. I ran outside of the house as my anxiety makes me a giant coward and when I finally mustered up the strength to go back in and get a video of it, the action had died down. I have a theory on what may be doing this though. I live in a pretty ghetto area with Nice places kind of scattered about to not make the place look so run down and I've lived in this general area for about 10 years now, only moving a block away from my old apartment. This area sees just all kinds of crimes though and I know two people who have been killed right outside my given area. An apartment building just next door to me had recently burned down too and I don't know the death toll from that but maybe also this may be part of the activity. I don't know a lot about the paranormal, and these are obviously just guesses, but there are just way more incidences than this too, but this is already getting pretty long. But before I finish up, I'd like to ask you guys something. I'm wondering, am I in any danger here? Have you guys got any advice on how to handle this? I can try to get some footage, but it's proven pretty difficult so far, because every time I pick up my phone, it just seems to stop. If you guys could let me know your thoughts though, that'd be great.